Hello there, my name is Christopher Pryor and I'm a lecturer in history at the University of Southampton. I'm very pleased today to be joined by Krista Petley, one of my colleagues within the School of History who works on slavery and empire, focus on the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Krista, hello. Hi. So one of Paxman's one of one of Paxman's concerns in the early portion of his book is is depicting a very grim tale of the state of slavery and plantations in the late eighteenth century. I was just wondering if you could flesh out some of that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So the, well, the system of slavery as it existed in the British Empire began uh, during the previous century in the seventeenth century, and as you'll get the impression from Jeremy Paxman's book, the the key. Uh, moment in creating this system is the development of sugar. So the development of sugar, particularly on the island of Barbados in the English Atlantic during the 17th century. And one of the reasons that um, sugar and slavery go together so, uh, so closely in this history is that uh, in order to grow sugar, you need a very large labour force and the, the labour that's required to raise sugar effectively is incredibly arduous, you know, very, very difficult work. And it lends itself, therefore, to having a very tractable, easily controlled labour force, a labour force of slaves. So we see from the 17th century into the 18th century, a system developing around the British Atlantic, whereby the British trade for slaves on the West African coast. They transport those slaves then to their colonies in the Caribbean. Those slaves work on plantations and produce sugar, and that sugar is then transported back to Britain to be consumed by growing numbers of people in the metropole. That, I think, is the crux of the story, although we should be aware that there are other parts to it. So, for instance, in North America, it's tobacco. So that crop, um, in famously, of course, in Virginia, is the slave-produced plantation crop that goes back from there to British consumers. So interestingly, we've got a picture of things that we now consider to be luxuries and vices um, being produced by slaves for English people to consume. So this is what's known as the triangular trade. The triangular trade is, yeah, it, it, it is precisely that relationship whereby goods are traded from Britain in exchange for slaves in West Africa. Slaves are then transported across the Atlantic to the Caribbean or other parts of British America. And then the things that those slaves produce, principally sugar, are shipped back to Britain. So Jeremy Paxman, the subtitle of his book Empire is what ruling the world did to the British. And how do you think slavery affected British people? That is interesting. Yeah. Jeremy Paxman calls his book What Ruling the World Did to the British. And he makes the point in his section on slavery that uh, sugar and other slave produced products do have a, a very profound impact on things back in Britain. And so some of the things that he picks up on, I think quite rightly, are the ways in which the British develop a sweet tooth. So in the 18th century, things like British puddings are created and that becomes a big part of the, the national diet. The British, as they spread out into the world, discover other things like tea. How do they sweeten that tea? Sugar from the West Indies. One of the things, the places where British people increasingly were meeting are coffee houses. And of course, they're, they're smoking tobacco, often produced by slaves in the Americas and, and drinking sugar sweetened drinks. So in those kinds of ways, you know, slavery shapes all sorts of aspects of British life, the sorts of things that people are consuming. Do you think the British were conscious of this? Do you think that they were conscious of their reliance upon Britain's external trade links involving the utilisation of slave labour? This is something that works on a number of different levels. So on the one hand, you might very well drink sugar sweetened tea and not necessarily think about where that comes from. So I think in, in many ways this does shape life, but in some ways almost subconsciously. But there are other ways in which um, sugar and slavery are reshaping Britain in the 18th century. One of them is socially. So we have groups of people who are returning from the colonies, having made their wealth there. Absentee sugar planters, people who've become rich as a result of their ownership of plantations, their exploitation of enslaved labour, coming back and becoming MPs. And the mayor of London in the middle of the 18th century, a character called William Beckford. And Beckford and his family had made their fortunes through sugar and through slavery in Jamaica. So right at the top of British politics, you've got groups, a group of people who have made good as a result of this system. And of course, there are 
a number of other ways that uh, sugar and slavery affect life in the 18th century for people in Britain. During the middle of the 18th century, sugar becomes the most important import into Britain. Of all of the things that are coming into Britain from overseas, sugar is, uh, by the middle of the 18th century, the most significant. And that remains the case for Britain right up until the 1820s. It's only with imports of raw cotton to, f to fuel the Industrial Revolution in the 1820s that, that we see sugar being knocked off its pedestal as the most important import into the British Isles. So what you're saying then is that there are very, very good reasons on a whole host of levels why British government, British elites, traders, merchants, what have you, would have a vested interest in maintaining this system. That's right. And, you know, it's something that affects people in Britain at all different social levels. So ordinary people are smoking and consuming the products of slaves. But there's a very significant tranche of the elite with very direct investments, I think that's correct to say. So we've got a sense then of some of the ways in which slavery was impacting upon domestic British society, but what about the other side of the situation? What about the slaves? Could you tell me something about how they were treated and, and you know, for example, the sorts of work that they got up to? One of the things that I think Jeremy Paxman says very clearly in the book is that this is a system that relies on violence and violence is at the heart of slavery. If you think about slavery as a system, as a set of relationships between people, it's almost impossible to imagine it without violence. How do you make someone a slave? How do you keep them a slave? And it's terror and the threat or the actual use of, uh, of physical violence that I think is incredibly important to that. So we're all familiar, of course, in thinking about a plantation with the whip and the whip is something that's used as ubiquitous on the plantation, used regularly to coerce slaves into their work. So I think that's the first thing to, to say, is that this is a system of, of violence and terror. Often though that worked in quite subtle ways. So one of the ways in which uh, plantation managers kept their slaves to work is by using rape. They would rape women in order to ensure that th those women knew their place, knew that they, they couldn't really do anything without the possibility of one of the white European overseers taking advantage of them. But that's also something that spreads uncertainty within the slave community more generally. So those people who are the friends, relations or partners of those women are also disempowered by that kind of behaviour. And so at all levels, I think, what sl how slavery works is by a deployment of physical violence, but that's deployed in order to undermine people, make sure that they're never really sure of where they stand and to continually make them feel uncomfortable and disempowered. So I think broadly speaking, that's how the system of discipline on the plantations worked. In terms of the sorts of work that slaves did, the majority of slaves in the Caribbean work on sugar plantations. And so they worked producing sugar, planting and, and reaping the sugar. But there's also a, a variety beyond that. So not all slaves are working in the fields. Not all slaves are involved in planting and harvesting sugar. That was the most arduous and difficult work on the plantation. But interestingly, there's a hierarchy amongst slaves on a plantation. And some more privileged slaves are given work around the works. Um, some very skilled slaves work turning the cane sugar into semi-refined sugar for export. Others are making barrels and uh, or working as blacksmiths and have these different kinds of roles and some work around the house as domestics. So we shouldn't think of all slaves as working in the fields on a plantation. Actually, the picture is much more complicated than that. On the basis of what you've just described, there could then be a temptation to see these slaves as merely passive victims of circumstance where they're being coerced by violence and by some of the other mechanisms that you talked about. But do you get a sense from your research that slaves actually retained any agency? Did they manage to resist or, or to negotiate within the system that they were operating in? Absolutely. I think, and I think this is one of the things actually that Jeremy Paxman in his book misses out. He talks in a sentence about slave resistance and a couple of rebellions, but this is something that is endemic in the system. So if, if violence is one side of things, with that comes resistance. And even on the ships across the Atlantic, slaves are resisting. So from the very beginning, 
of their enslavement. Uh, one in 10 slave ships across the Atlantic experiences a slave revolt, an uprising. And regular uprisings take place uh, in the colonies on the plantations. But that's not the only thing to be thinking about when we think about slave resistance. Uh, violent uprisings are part of that, but they also resist, resisted on a day-to-day -day basis. So, for example, they might work slowly. They could break tools. They would steal. Some would run away for long periods of time or short periods of time. There's a whole spectrum of activity that comes under this heading of resistance, whereby slaves tried to do what they could to push back or fight back or find small ways in which, although caught up in this oppressive system, they could do something, often something quite small, to make a little bit of space for themselves just give themselves that little bit of extra space within the system that would make it more bearable. Now, Paxman's very blunt in his description of slavery is one of the most disgraceful episodes in British history. We as historians are you know, supposed to be objective and, and consider both sides of, of, of any case, but really, is there, is there anything that we can possibly disagree with on in terms of Paxman's uh, assessment of this? Well, he makes the case, which is actually incredibly difficult to, to disagree with, that this is a disgraceful episode. And um, in many ways, it's, it, it is a deeply depressing topic to, to research and think about. This system, as we've talked about, based around violence, based around exploitation. Nevertheless, it is something that historians um, disagree about. They do find reasons to, to, to debate slavery and its relationship with Britain. Uh, one of the things that historians have uh, not always seen eye to eye on is the precise relationship between slavery and uh, the British Isles. So was this a central part of the creation of Britain during the 18th century or was it simply a peripheral thing happening across the Atlantic? Some historians have argued that the periphery was peripheral that um, awful as slavery was, and as lucrative as it was for some individuals, it didn't actually have that much effect on Britain itself during the 18th century. Others have disagreed with that perspective and a, a point of view that emphasises the importance of slavery to the development of Britain in the 18th century is recently, I think, becoming more popular among historians who argue that the, the sugar trade as a central pillar of the trade around the British Empire focused on the Atlantic in the 18th century really did transform the British economy. So that's one area of debate, you know, how much did trade in slave produced products impact on the economy back home? Historians also disagree about the character of slavery itself. And you see often quite subtle disagreements between those historians who want to talk about the experience of, of slaves in terms of resistance. They seek through their research to think about the ways in which enslaved people exercised the kind of agency that you were talking about. How did slaves fight and push back against the system? Others take a much bleaker view of things and actually perhaps tend a bit towards what you described as a passive, uh, the idea of slaves as passive victims and suggest that actually this was an incredibly damaging institution that created awful conditions for its victims who actually were unable in many cases to resist, to survive. And so you have, if you like, two different kinds of stories there. One which seeks to offer what might be considered somewhat of a romantic view of slaves gallantly fighting back, which is attractive for all sorts of reasons. And another which is a more pessimistic view, which sees this as an awful and um, destructive um, system of exploitation. So that was then uh, a brief overview, an introduction to slavery as it existed in the 18th century. And in another podcast, we will look at the end of slavery and abolition. Christopher Petley, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.